Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Taiwan Studies program book talk series. My name is Professor James Lin. Uh, I am an assistant professor of Taiwan Studies here at the University of Washington. And today we are very honored to welcome uh, Dominic Yang, uh, Yang Mengshen. Uh, so uh, Professor Yang is uh, an assistant professor of East Asian history at the University of Missouri, Columbia. His research focuses on the massive exodus out of China and into Taiwan and around the world following the Chinese Communist victory in 1949. Professor Young has published numerous articles uh, in China Perspectives, oh. Journal of Chinese Overseas, Historical Reflections, and Taiwan Shi and Jill. Today he'll be talking about his uh, newly published book, which I am very lucky to actually have just received my copy very recently, uh, The mm -hmm. Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory, and Identity in Modern Taiwan, published by Cambridge University Press late last year. Uh, I've only known Dominic for a couple of years, but I'm, I'm really happy to welcome him virtually today. Um, even though he is a, a young scholar himself, uh, he's been such a generous uh, scholar and advocate for Taiwan studies here, uh, including his leadership in the North America Taiwan Studies Association. So I'm glad that we can have a bit of his time to share with us with the UW Taiwan Studies community and with uh, interested Taiwan Studies community members around the world. Um, my students have already read uh, your book with me in, in the fall and I'm assigning again uh, for my undergraduate course this quarter and I think some of my students are attending today. So uh, we, we really enjoyed reading your book um, and we really look forward to your talk today, Dominic. Okay. Well, um, hi everyone. <laughs> I'm James, thank you for that. Uh, very kind introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I did my uh, graduate degrees at University of British Columbia, and uh, of course, uh, my parents still live in Vancouver, and because UW is so close, right? <laughs> so I drive down there, you know, for from time to time, and I always enjoy Seattle very much, and it's such um, an honor and, and privilege uh, to be invited by you know, now the newly established uh, Taiwan Studies program in North America, and I believe in which I believe under James' leadership will soon become, or if it's not already the best <laughs> in North America in terms of Taiwan Studies. So thank you very much once again. Now, um, I'm going to basically, um, this is, I was told in an, about an hour and a half session, so I think for the benefits of uh, those who haven't read the book, right, um, I will basically just do a presentation for about, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, and that should leave us, you know, a lot of time for discussion, right? So um, I have to ask CJ to do the PowerPoint slides because we're having some technical difficulties earlier. So yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, thank you, CJ. I will, I will tell you, you know, when to, uh, go to the next slide. And now, so this is uh, this is me again. Uh, I am assistant professor East Asian Studies, uh, University of Missouri, and the book. Well, it says 2020 first year, but it actually came out last year, late last year. So, CJ, uh, next slide. Yeah, and so you know some basics about. Um, the group of, of people that I study. Um, they're called, you know, Minglanders or uh, Waishangren. And this is, you know, when I, you know, choose what topic that I really want to do for, uh, for, my, for my PhD dissertation, right? Of course, uh, my family originally came from Taiwan. I was, uh, uh, you know, my family came, you know, went to Canada or immigrated to Canada from Taiwan when I was 14 years old. And so, but I enter the program at British, uh, University of British Columbia, kind of to do Asian history, uh, comparative history uh, between Taiwan and Korea. Um, but then I later on switched on to something else. And also, I also got into uh, China studies, modern Chinese history. Of course, I, I sort of went to China and, and of course back to Taiwan during a time when I was looking for research topic to do, right? 
And, you know, and this topic came to me and I'll, I'll talk about it because, because of, you know, my curiosity, you know, not only, you know, like, you know, to do research on Taiwan, the place I was born, right, and my family was from, but also the fact that, you know, when I returned to Taiwan, you know, go to Taiwan to do research or find research topic, you know, it was like in the late 2000s and it wasn't, you know, sort of a time when mid late 2000s, uh, but towards the, uh, um, the, the presidency, the second presidency of, of Chen Shui-bian, which was uh, a time where you have a lot of uh, what we call the ethnic conflicts. And it really sort of, you know, and I became intrigued in this sort of, you know, what was back then sort of portrayed as an ethnic conflict problem. But, you know, I quickly, you know, sort of the way in which I, I see it, right, it wasn't just an ethnic sort of problem. And I always thought that framework should be a little bit simplistic. Um, it's for me, it's, you know, it's, it's conflict over memory, right? And there's this group of people who are, and, and it's not only the mainlanders or Weishengren and Taiwan are actually uh, producing memories, you know, and try to basically redefine themselves uh, in this, you know, new democratized Taiwan. It's like everyone. And so why do I pick the mainlanders? Because I think they're the one that's, you know, the, you know, for me, at least for me, because my family, um, like we, I came from a native Taiwanese family, so I have very little understanding of the, the mainlander family. And then, of course, they're this minority who, had basically became this sort of, um, I, I, you know, I, I think I use these words uh, in my book, right? They're basically just um, became this sort of lost. And there are people saying that they became this a sort of a diaspora a person, you know, people that sort of live between, right? Then they don't belong to China. They, they feel that, you know, they used to, used to be that their home was in China, but then when they went home, uh, in the late 80s and, and and the 90s, they found out China was not home. They came back to Taiwan and then Taiwan democratized and all of a sudden they became colonizers. Or I should say that in the, maybe in the minds of a lot of, you know, local Taiwanese, they have all, you know, pre-1945 residents um, and their children that, you know, the mainlanders have, you know, have always been colonizers, but it's just like the, the well, the, this kind of shock when they discover that, you know, the locals actually sort of perceive them that way. And then, and, and so, uh, and the mainlanders, like everyone else is actually producing a lot of memory and those memories or stories or oral history actually um, sort of center on uh, their, the experience of 1949, or I should say the experience of exile, displacement, none belonging that's associated with the great exodus of 1949. And this is, you know, the, the, the book project, the main title of the book project, right? And so again, you know, before we go on, just some basics about who these people are, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm speaking to a Taiwan studies crowd here and I don't really need to go that much into the specific but this is for, you know, the benefit of people that are here, but, you know, that do not do Taiwan studies or and, and, and so this is so these are the, you know, the basics. Right. You know, so the mainlanders or um, in, in in Chinese, Wai Sheng Ren uh, refer to the roughly one million Chinese civil wars exiles who had been displayed to Taiwan before, during and following a collapse of of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist regime in China, and of course, uh, the exiles, Taiwan-born descendants, um, the, the second generation mainland and the third generation mainlanders. Um, but though I will argue by the time you get to the third generation, um, a lot of, you know, people of mainland descent really do not like the label of mainlanders. Uh, of course, well, we're going to talk about that, right? Um, so contrary to popular belief, the first generation mainlanders, so the, the exiles, right, they were not a homogenous population of anti-communist diehards uh, formed by nationalist elites and the loyal support of Chiang Kai-shek. And you see, this is the one of, one of the biggest thing about, you know, or I would say the misconceptions about these people uh, that, you know, because there's really 
not that much research that that has been done. Like besides my book, I mean, in I mean, in the English language scholarship, I will say, you know, there's really well, you 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 do have like. You know, translated novel like Bai Xianyong's, you know, Taipei Ren or Taipei characters that everyone reads, right? You know, besides these, and and then besides, you know, some literary work in my book, there's really only two other um, books written by um, two other historians, um, and those came out like in twenty, you know, like twenty eleven and twenty and twenty twelve, and they're really late. And basically, there's really not much much research, and I do talk about why, right? It has to do with the way in which, you know, the Cold War historiography on on Taiwan and on China, and especially on the Chinese Civil War, being perceived as this revolution, right? and then for the longest time, and still, the biggest problem, the biggest issue. That people try to study in the Chinese Civil War, it is still why the nationalists lost and that why the Chinese Communists won, right? And because of all of this, um, there's really not a lot um, on this, you know, population movement. I study it as a population movement. It's, you know, it's an instance of forced migration, one of the largest in post World War East Asia. That's really not study as a population movement. Um, so. And so it's it's a pretty diverse population. Um, as I said, you know, there were there were here in fact a large army of peasants and refugee students. Uh, they were drafted into the nationalist army against their will at the very end of the Chinese Civil War when all the divisions were depe depleted and uh, the nationalist unit uh, they were going to get on board to go to Taiwan, right? Hey, you know, you go down to the countryside and you start mass kidnapping people or in the cities that you're pulling out, right? In the city of Qingdao and its vicinity and, and you just basically grab a huge number of eligible male from the population. So these a lot of these people are definitely not diehard nationalist supporters, right? Then there were also this is an intellectuals, you know, progressive journalists. These people are pretty anti KMT and they ended up in the nationalist jail. Um, you know, victims of nationalist white terror, just like the native Taiwanese in the nineteen fifties. And, you know, basically just people from all walks of life. Um, Ordinary refugees would basically just try to run away from the war because, you know, Taiwan was a place that's relatively untouched by the civil war until the very end. So, yeah, of course, you can argue that you have some got to be you got to have some means to go to Taiwan. But again, you know, there are all these ships uh, carrying refugees to go to Taiwan in, in you know, starting in, in late 1948 and, and then all the way to like, you know, the fall of the nationalist regime uh, in, in, in mid 1949. The, the regime relocated uh, in late 1949 because they went inland into Sichuan, into Guangzhou and Sichuan, all these places. Right? The fall, but the fall of Shanghai. Was in was in May 1949, but anyway, uh, CJ, the next slide, please. Yeah, and so it's 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 also important to note that historically, before democratization, uh, both the displaced nationalist leaders um, and the first generation exiles. I, I separate the nationalist leader from the exiles, but you know they're all mainlanders, right? But there's this nationalist leadership, and then there is there is this very diverse group of people that came with them uh, from China. Um, they use this label of Weishengren. And so there's this English term called the mainlanders, right? These people in Taiwan came from the mainland, or they're called the mainlanders. But you know the idea of Weishengren, you know, actually literally means people that you know, came from outside of province or from this other province, right? That's a it's it's a term that's that was actually used in China, especially during the resistance war. <laughs> the local people of Sichuan province will call, you know, refugees from Shanghai and from Wuhan uh, during the resistance war, Wai Shengren, <laughs> like people coming from um, from outside of our province, right? And this sort of, there is this distinction between Ban Sheng and, and Wai Sheng then in China, but then it was the use, the usage of the term, you know, you know, sort of continue like in Taiwan. And this local and pro provincial sort of, and, and local and other province distinction came from the idea of provincial native place or Ji Guan in China. 
Um, in Taiwan, the nationalists had reinforced this difference, particularly in its p official population registry, right? And you have, you know, the, when you look at the population registry of the uh, at the ROC on Taiwan is actually quite interesting. At the very beginning, they 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 make you know like you know different province of people, and you're if you're you know, and it's usually patrilineal, right? If your children born of your father of the refugee came from Jiangsu province, and you're registered as a Jiangsu you know person in Taiwan, and this was done to maintain the semblance of a nation formed by different people of all provinces of China. And, and this was abolished in 1992 when Taiwan democratized. And so there is, and what I'm going to argue here, and it's part of the argument of the book, right? Before democratization, you know, before the late 1980s and early 1990s, before the mainlanders and their children get to go home to China and get disappointed and came back to Taiwan and feel hated by the low coast. Um, there wasn't really, you know, the, the term Wai Sheng Ren, you know, is actually used, you know, daily basically to just to distinguish the, the outside and inside provincial differences. But it wasn't really sort of, um, it was not an ethnic label or there's not n not a group of people called, collectively called Wai Shenren or, or Wai Shenren in Taiwan, right? And this is what I'm arguing with. Although the book is, you know, you know, as you'll see, it's about historical memory or the, or should I say the trauma different forms of trauma experienced by this population I'm talking about through time, right? But, you know, in the end, there is this cultural trauma of the great exodus being articulated uh, by, you know, the second and third generation in Taiwan, people that are producing stories of Lao Bing, uh, of, uh, of the, these old soldiers, or or story of 1949 of the exiles, or the story of the community they grew up in, the mill the culture. So a lot of them are called Jen Tsun, right? Uh, military families, villages. I mean, these are all communities of exile, of displacement. And the source of that displacement was 1949, right? And all of that, that's a cultural trauma, a common cultural trauma of the mainlander identity in contemporary Taiwan. And my interpretation of why they're producing that is to basically produce their own history. And that history center on the great exodus. And behind that is to make themselves part of the national community in, in, in democratized Taiwan, right? And so this is the this is the argument. Why are they so? I would say that there is actually, although there's always a problem with people when you ask when you ask them about these in in national survey, like are you a mainlander or do you identify yourself as? Because in Taiwan's national survey, there are people there there are questions asking people to sort of state their ethnicity, right? Are you Hoklo or you're Hakka or you're, or you're uh, one of the indigenous peoples or one of the tribes or, um, or you're uh, Xinju Ming, your new residents, right? These are the categories that people, or you don't want to respond to any of these, but you will find that, you know, although statistically there should be like 10 to 13% of people in Taiwan that supposedly are people of mainland descent, and they should say, um, I'm a mainlander, but you will find that, you know, um, in the post-democracy survey, there's always a portion of mainlander population, probably, you know, up to 40%, even 50% of them will refuse to identify with the mainlander label. And of course, it is because that this entire group is stigmatized as colonizers that came in with Chiang Kai-shek's regime, right? With, with it's an it's authoritarian regime um, is, you know, bought, and from some of the local Taiwanese circles or this new Taiwanese history written that it's a colonial re regime, just like the previous Japanese rule, right? And then these people coming in as colonizers and, and oppressors, despite this very complex history, right? And then 
under these circumstances, you can certainly understand why uh, the and 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 with the mainlanders we're, today, we're not talking about the original. Uh, we're talking about the, those actually born in in Taiwan, and they are producing this. Uh, they are producing the memories of their parents in order to sort of redefine themselves, right? Um, uh, CJ, the next slide, please, if you will. Now, um, in the early um, 1990s, in the wake of Taiwan's democratization, there is this emergence of, uh, you know, it's an emergence of self-determinists. Um, my screen suddenly stop, uh, start flashing. I don't know if you guys see it on your end, but anyway, um, mainlanders or white Sherman has been designated as one of the ethnic groups that makes up Taiwan's new national community in both political discourse and population survey. Um, it is important to recognize that due to the decades of intermarriage cohabitation in present, in present day Taiwan, the boundaries among the so-called ethnic groups are, you know, neither stable, nor are they apparent in certain situations. In fact, many Taiwan-born children and grandchildren of the now dwindling first uh, generation mainland exiles have learned to speak fluent Taiwanese. And some have rejected the appellation of Waishan, as I said, right? um, due to the political and social stigmatization that label carries in post-liberalization Taiwan. As colonizer to the islands, pre-1945 residents, a stooges of Chiang Kai-shek's authoritarian rule, and as unwarranted recipients of state benefits, because they're mostly in civil service and in the military, right? But I'm not trying to defend uh, the mainlanders, but or, or the nationalist region. I, I should say I'm trying to basically, because I'm sympathetic to the mainlanders, but not to the nationalist regime because it is a dictatorial regime, right? But you know, you see that you know when you have a refugee population, right? When people came here, you know, a lot of them with the, only the clothes on their back, they can only rely on the regime, right? And you can you can look at it as an unfairness. Uh, but if the regime didn't actually take care of some of the, and, and they did, they didn't really do a good job of taking the lower class mainlanders anyway. <laughs> if, if they, if they did, that you don't, you won't end up with that many uh, of these old, old veterans that live uh, perpetually on the margins of society later on, right? But they, if they didn't really provide some of the, benefit that's going to take care of these people there'll be social chaos really so i guess you know that's what we need to basically think about um so uh cj next slide now so you know after that really really long background right so what is the book about anyway <laughs> like if i you know want to sort of put it in a nutshell right um what what's up with you know memories and trauma and that identity I already talked about it but you know What's up with memory and trauma? Um, so the book, if you look at right, like chronologically, is tracing different traumas of displacement experienced by the mainlanders in Taiwan. And, you know, when you go into the 1970s and, and 80s, when the second generation came of age, uh, they're Taiwan born children as well. And it's through time, right? And so in a nutshell, it's a history of mainlander traumas. Uh, because there are different traumas, as I said, experienced by them, and also social memory production in response to these different social traumas, you know, at different historical period. From the moment they left China in the mid 20th century to their homecomings, there are two homecomings, the homecoming, the shock of the homecoming in China, that's pretty traumatic, and the shock of their own homecoming back to Taiwan, where they're all certainly now uh, locals saying to them, you should go back to China, you pick. Uh, and that's pretty shocking, especially for the people who the mainlanders were born in Taiwan. All right, so uh, CJ, the next slide. So the book's main argument, and I, I already said this, uh, it's about mainlander identity. Uh, mainland Taiwan-born mainlanders are now converging on the traumatic and diasporic memory revolve around the great exodus from China. And I said that I call this cultural trauma. So there are two different forms of 
trauma that I, and they're all collective in, in a sense, right? The, so the cultural trauma is like you basically go back to produce um, these diasporic and traumatic narrative associated with war, you know, relocate, uh, dislocation and displacement. So that's a cultural trauma that, that you know, all descendants of mainlander, this group of people in Taiwan will have in common, right? You know, from Chiang Kai shek's children down to the children of the foot soldiers, right? So that's, you know, a way to basically reposition themselves in post liberalization Taiwan. It's the way, and I argue, right? Like I said, some people, some people might not agree with that argument, but this is what I see. It is their way of becoming Taiwanese. It is a history that's different from, uh, the, you know, group of people that are different from the rest of Taiwan. They still, to a certain degree, um, sort of identify with Taiwan, but of course, in this history, um, the RO, the history of ROC is extremely important, and the history of the Nationalist Party in Taiwan is also very important, right? And they all see that being, being, you know, identified to these as a part of them being identified uh, with Taiwanese, and of course, behind that, there is this Sinophone Chinese culture, the larger ones that they're also uh, identifying to, right? And in terms of the historiographical uh, contribution, I'll say, you know, it's quite obvious. I, I sort of mentioned it earlier. It is really moving away, you know, of <laughs> my work, the, the kind of stuff that I'm trying to accomplish here. And it's basically moving away from the debate of why CCP won and then KMD laws. I mean, oh my God, we're on that for the longest time, right? And, you know, and, and what I said here not only applies to Taiwan, it applies to places like Hong Kong where there's huge um, escape. They're called the escapees, right? Um, and, and also inside China as well. Like, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, the purging counter revolutionary, uh, you know, during the Korean War, early 1950s, you see, I see that as part of the Civil War <laughs> instead of, you know, like different periodized the Civil War ends in 1949. No, it's actually the, the new regime neutralizing uh, what it perceives as the, the enemies within, right? So there is a problem with the chronology of the Chinese Civil War if we look at it. If we basically look at the aftermath instead of just debating why who lost and when and why when yeah the communists lost because they got the support of the people of the passage right yeah of course now all of us can see that that's such a simplistic thinking and that's very problematic um next slide cj so um theoretical interventions um uh, again, this part is a little bit complicated, and you know, unless you want to sort of discuss, you know, more during the, uh, you know, during the Q and A session, I think, you know, because my book is kind of ambitious in its sort of theoretical engagement uh, to trauma and memory studies. First of all, this is a huge school, like it's interdisciplinary. So I, I don't profess to make an argument that's going to solve all the differences within trauma and memory studies. And then, of course, my most, you know, first and foremost, my engagement is really with trauma. And because, you know, with their different school of trauma studies that have different views on memory, right? And so what I'm trying to, and, and I identify two major schools, the psychoanalytical school, and they're, I, I think, you know, pretty dominant, especially in literature and postmodernism, uh, you know, pro, post, you know, so this sort of postmodern look at psycho and, and, and trauma that came out of the 19th century, late 19th century Freudian psychoanalysis. You're in this shock and you can't remember and people have to help you restore memory, <laughs> have to hypnotize you. And so that's one school. And right? the other school is the sociological notion of tra traumatic memory. And that's basically collective memory studies, you know, that came out of the, uh, um, the you know, sociological notion associated with the work of Maurice Habak, right? Um, and basically, I see, just put it very simple term, I see both term, you know, both schools is a little bit problematic. And I said that, you know, they're not, you know, you know, completely, I, I don't want to use the word wrong, right? But at least, you know, when, when you, when you look at the cases that I, you know, this um, 
the the people that I study, right? Um, and I said that because you know through this historical trajectory that I examine, there are all these you know multiple traumas that they went through because of how people perceive their conditions of exile, and that condition of exile actually changed. And I always, when I when I give my talk, I always mention Edward Said, right? You know, it's it's, it's the text, the 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 text uh, is a reflection on exile written by Edward Said, and a lot a lot of people have read that. I have read that, and I you know I I always find it to be a really beautiful piece of literature. Um, but I have one problem with it because it describes a condition of exile that's living in this perpetual state of sameness, universal suffering of and nostalgia to go home, right? And I find that to be extremely problematic, you know, given that I'm a historian, I see times change and people change. People still want, people still have nostalgia. They still want to go home, right? But what that home is, the search for that belonging, right? For example, you know, whereas the mainlanders, first generations in the 1950s, that was the time they still were looking for to go back to China, that home was in China. But, you know, if you fast forward to their their children and grandchildren, you know, when they're talking about home, I would argue that that home was no longer China. That home is still elusive because they're not accepted either in China or in their birthplace, Taiwan, right? And there is still this, this conditions of lost. There is this still, production of memory and try to make themselves feel better, try to reassert themselves, right? But then the mechanism you see, or or or, or even where what that home is, right? It's very different historically. And this is what I say that if you if you know, this is why I said that, you know, the problem with these schools because they all have this what I call the single event fallacy, where whereas, you know, trauma is this huge event. And something happened to you, you get hit by a car or, you know, you get sort of molested by your uh, by your like stepfather when you're young and that event happened and that cripples you for the rest of your life. You're trying to come to terms with it. There's only one event. And then the memory studies as well, like if they're talking about the commemoration of one memory and how that commemoration sometimes can be extremely problematic because that's where you get ethnic nationalism and people killing each other because of the grudges in the past, right? But that was memory maybe sometimes fabricated, instrumental for you to have that kind of, you know, national and ethnic violence, right? And this is why I say here that, you know, for the psychoanalytical school, they tend to problematize the access to traumatic memory. Like once you recover it, come to turn with it, everything will be fine. The second is that, you know, the second school sociological tend to problematize what I call the access. You know, that's too much. Um, it's problematic. Uh, too much Holocaust memory can be bad. You know, look at how Israel deal with, yeah, because Holocaust is a big thing for them, right? But the flip side of that is like, if you think of yourself as the um, the victim of in the entire humanity of the whole world, then you'll have problems seeing how you're also displacing the Palestinians. <laughs> so you're displaced from Europe, but now you're displacing the Palestinians, right? And you have trouble seeing that. And that's the excess of traumatic memory. So I hope that I explained it uh, clearly here. Mm. So 33 minutes. So I have seven minutes left. Um, but let's, let's move on. Uh, CJ, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so let, let me talk really briefly about the chapters, and then I'll show you some of the slides of the uh, the specific content and photos. People like photos and graphs, and we'll do that in the next, you know, uh, in, in you know very quickly. In, in the last maybe three minutes. And before that, I want to spend, you know, a couple of minutes really talking about uh, the specific chapter. So, oh, so you said, yeah, not single event, right? Not single trauma. So what are the, these traumas you're talking about other than that cultural trauma that comes in at the end that people remember, people try to sort of latch onto it right now, right? What are those um, events? Well, well um, basically, uh, in my chapters, I said there are four different uh, mainlander social traumas. And to deal with these social trauma, different social trauma through time, 
there is, you know, memory or, or, or mnemonic, I call it mnemonic regimes, right? salience of certain memory. Again, like I said, don't get me wrong. It, it, it is not like all people remember are these. When I use the word salience, I mean, there's a lot for that period. And then it becomes less important later on, right? It's like now the most important memory is 1949 memory, right? The, the kind of, exo you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, diasporic and traumatic experience of that displacement associated with. That's important for the mainlanders living right now, but that wasn't that important for, for yeah, that wasn't really that important in the 1950s. So what's it very important for the, so, so chapter one, I talked about social traumas of the exodus. Yeah, that's an, obviously. And then, but I also said that the great exodus also created social trauma for the local Taiwanese, right? Because you just imagine that six million local people, uh, the economic situation in Taiwan is very bad. And now you're made to accommodate one million. Uh, most of them came with only the clothes on their back. The kind of social destruction that's called, and in itself is a social trauma. But the time, but that's not the the main Taiwanese cultural trauma nowadays. We all know it's white terror and and two two eight, of course. Right? And so this is, you know, interesting. You know why certain why when we look back we focus on certain you know events as this cultural trauma, but which is a little bit different from the actual different kinds of social trauma that people in the past experience. And so chapter two. Um, I talked about, you know, in order to deal with the social trauma of the exodus, how do they deal with it? Well, they didn't produce the memory of 1949 because politically that's also not allowed. Right? And the resistance war in China, their, their previous refugee experience became really important in the 50s. Because why? why? Because first of all, that's allowed politically. Um, the Nationals won that war. The second is that, you know, um, um, a lot of people actually went on exile, not necessarily in Chongqing, but they had the experience of running away from Japanese invasion. And you know what? After eight years or 12 years for the people from Manchuria, they get to go home. And you see, and that's when there's still hope of going home, right? So resistance war memory was really big in the 1950s. And then in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, when there is this diminishing hope of return, and that's very traumatic, I would argue, that remembering the native places and hometowns in China where they grew up and became extremely important, and they did that, and I call this cultural nostalgia, right? <laughs> using Bai Shenyong's you know, term, Wen Hua Xiang Chou. Uh, they did it for the longest time. Um, uh, CJ, uh, next slide. So, and then, you know, chapter four, the role, so, so, so chapter three, that trauma was called the cultural, the the social trauma of the diminishing diminishing hope, right? Because there's this feeling that you know what you might ever see home in your life, and the family you live behind was gone forever. There's this possibility that's gone forever, right? And then you try to basically reconstruct what you lost, and then also you try to pass on this native place memory. Like, you know, people from Sichuan province will create this magazine called Sichuan Wenxian and it will basically with, you know, what home cooking is like, home cuisine, what are the special products of all these different provinces, right? And it's provincial. And so you see, in terms of identity, there is no unified Wai Shang Ren Men Enter identity under this identity of being citizens of Republic of China under the national identity, but instead it's different provincial identities, right? And they produce memory according, you know, to that, of course, and it became different after the democracy. And, and they want to basically, the first generation mainlander, in, when they produce these memories, they want to pass on this memory to their children, right? But this is where it gets interesting, right? Their children didn't pick it up. They didn't accept this memory that their parents want them to remember. Instead, when they went back to China, you know, they, they accept a, a lot of it, then went back to China and say, oh my God, this is so different from my parents tell us, <laughs> right? And this is basically not my home. And they their parents felt the same way too. And then when both generation came back to Taiwan, the entire Taiwan society say, hey, you're all foreigners. And this is when 
1949 came in, right? Those are the memories that the Taiwan-born mainlanders latch on to, right? To show the rest of Taiwan that, you know what? We're also immigrants just like you. And you know what? We are, we were, you know, people escaping oppression, uh, war. We're exiles, right? We, we have a lot of calm, a lot of thing in common with you, with the rest of Taiwan, right? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? This is, this is why, and, and this is, you know, and, and so the, there were these two social traumas of homecoming, as I said, one in China, the other one in, in, in Taiwan, and, and those combine to make what I call the last sort of me memory regime, right? Or, um, Mimari regime. So there's three regime. One is regime of remembering the resistance war. The second one, the regime of remembering the native place in China. The third regime is remembering the exodus, right? So that's in a nutshell is the book. Now I know I've basically spent 40 minutes, right? And because I want to have more time for discussion. So I'm just going to show you like, you know, some of the photos, uh, you know, that's, you know, with, you know, and highlighting some of the research findings, you know, because people still want to see photos and, and, and graphs. And then that's going to take you know, about a couple of minutes and then we'll move on, you know, straight to the Q&A session. Right. OK, so I'm going to. So, CJ, could you move to the next slide? OK, we'll, we'll skip this slide, you know, the diaspora we can talk about it, and, and, and skip this one as well. Let's go on. And yeah, these are old soldiers literature. You know, they're pretty, they're definitely, you know, and, and, and people see them as, you know, fictions, right? As history. I see these as memory, part of the mainlander memory that started. This trend actually started before democratization, right? And it was the second generation that actually producing them in starting in the late seventies and eighties. Um, next slide, CJ. And of course, the story of Jensen or, or military families. Again, a lot of these interesting developments happened in the 19, late 1970s and, and, and early 1980s. And that was the time when the nationalists when started to tear down a lot of these old villages, right? And you can see that the second generation mainlanders, be, this was before democratization. I mean, the idea was that their, their, their entire history is going to be taken away. And also the 70s and the 80s, when they, that, that, that's when the Taiwanese really came out and fight. And there's this historical discourse that the mainlander heard, hear about, at the, you know, starting to hear about, about how they're very different from all these other peoples on the island. Right? And so, you know, and, you know, it was, it, it's, it's actually quite funny when, you know, when people talk to me about my work, especially Taiwanese scholars, because they all have to a certain degree, not the knowledge of what I'm saying, but they'll, they'll be like, okay, you're writing an English book about the mainlanders and you, you must be writing a lot about Juanchun, the military dependent village, uh, military families villages or, or Lao Bing or, or, or also, I said, yeah, I do write about them, but most of my book is, you know, it was part of my chapter to explain why military families village and old soldiers became now representative of of mainlander memory or mainlander culture in Taiwan, instead of saying that they are, because not all mainlanders were 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 all soldiers, and not all of them live in military families village. I mean, there's less than one third of them actually <laughs> live in a military family village. But why do these became um, you know, the main thrust of their memory. There is this historical process. If you read my book, you, you'll see that. Uh, CJ, the next one. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with these, you know, uh, Long Ying Tai's Da Jiang Da Hai and Qi Bang Yuan's Ju Liu He. And there's a movie on, on Taiping Lun, the ship that sunk, um, you know, and, you know, then that was basically, you know, made by a Chinese movie conglomerates, right? When the, this narrative went to China and it was a little bit problematic over there. We can, we can talk about these. Uh, CJ, next one. I'm going to go fit through these really quickly. Uh, next one. Very quickly. And, you know, the, my research use like, you know, population, you know, it's, 
you, you, you'll, you'll see that there are different components of to these books, right? Some of the books, some of the chapters are extremely empirical with, you know, a lot of these different, um, you know, and so CJ, the next one, um, you know, so I really go into, um, you know, the, the, I, you know, how should I put it? The, uh, what this population movement look like, you know, with, you know, population surveys and census, um, as you can see here, the, if you look at this, 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 um, mainlander population, the original one, right. And compare this with the previous one, which is Taiwanese population, you'll see a lot of, uh, male population from age 25 to 50, right. And, and no female population. If you look at that, you'll be like, yeah, that's, you know, then that's, 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 people leaving home and leaving their female relatives in, in Taiwan, right? CJ, the next one. And, you know, again, you know, suicide rates, that's another interesting. And these are all basically, by the way, in chapter two, when I talked about, when I say social trauma of displacement, what does it mean, right? It doesn't mean because I say so, there's social trauma. There are actually these numbers um, that when you compare the local population, although the local population are also traumatized in a way, but they're traumatized differently, right? There are different type of trauma. And, and this is the trauma associated with relocation, right? And so CJ, the next one. Yeah, again, you know, crime rates and everything. So I think, you know, I'm going to basically stop it there because I do want us to have, you know, a lot of time for a Q&A. So let me just stop there and uh, and now open the floor for questions so we can pull out of the uh, um, the slides. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, so we have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, feel free to add, uh, for our audience members, feel free to add your questions uh, on whatever platform you're using, YouTube or, or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, here, this, this is an interesting question. Um, on the lack of mainlander studies, is it partly because the knowledge about Taiwan had been dominated by the powerful group of mainlanders per se, in particular before Taiwan's democratization, so they did not need to question themselves and their knowledge production as a subfield. Uh, this kind of works like heterosexuals produce knowledge of sexuality, use power to call out sexual minorities and be left out of being named for being interrogated. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to answer that question right away or? Yeah, yeah I think we have, we have plenty of time. So why don't you go okay. ahead? Yeah, I think this is a wonderful question. Um, and I would say yes, because if you look at, you know, Taiwan's historical development, right, and it, it is really not until um, democratization where, because before that, it was quite, you know, it's like ROC on Taiwan, right? There's this entire system of, um, the, the historical memory that's associated with the ROC region. And part of that is in, a lot of that is in China, right? And, and, and all of this, but until, and, and you, and, and you are, and the person asking this question is absolutely right to point out that, um, it's because the knowledge about Taiwan is, you know, dominated by power group of group of mainlanders, mainlander elites. That are into this. Um, they're they're calling it, you know, protecting the lineage of Fato, right? <laughs> People in Taiwan studies, or or China studies, or national, or familiar with nationalist history will will know what I'm talking about. This this broken line of a Chinese culture passing down from the common ancestor of Huangdi and all the way down, right? Different dynasties until it goes to Sun Yat-sen and goes to Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang Kai-shek took that to Taiwan, right? And that, that regime in, in China, the communist one is the illegitimate regime has moved away from Fato with cultural revolution, destroying Chinese culture. And we're the one that's preserving it now. And so, all of that was pretty dominant. And of course, um, mainlander population, a lot of them bought into that, really. And it wasn't really until, as I said, um, that mainlander collectively starting to lose power 
And of course, it's a very complicated process. That first of all, there was this shock when we, when they themselves went to China, and basically, it's like that's really not my home, and my relative now acts like aliens. I don't really know how to deal with them. There was this very roller coaster ride experience when you saw them for the first time. It's like, oh my god, I haven't seen you for years, and they they cry, they hug each other. And then later, they, it was a, it was not a very good dynamic. Right? I mean, the, we have these stories of people, you know, mainland relatives keep demanding more and more money, and then it, it ends up being heartbreaking. But like I said, I can totally understand from the mainland Chinese side. They're like, oh, because of you went to Taiwan, do you know how like we are Hei Wu Lei, we're like black fight elements now, and do you know how much we have to suffer because of you? It's all your fault, and this is the least you can do, right? And for the ones that return from Taiwan, it's like they want to see their family for the longest time. I mean, the first time when I saw it, it was absolutely like all the emotions came out. But later on, it was like, oh my God, you you think so differently than me. And then all you want is money, and that was. And I spent years in Taiwan just trying to get. It was, and then. Went through that, and then coming back to Taiwan, and then when Taiwan democratized, there was a very rapid process in which the rise of Taiwanization, right, and and the sort of deconstruction that that entire um, cultural edifice that the national, or if if not complete this deconstruction at the very beginning, but chipping away of it, and then you need to find another sort of center, right, and this is when these uh, these a lot of these second generation mainlander elite you know started to rethink you know how they they can basically adapt to this change right and so you are absolutely right this is this is this is this is the process it was just pretty complicated you know when i basically describe it that way but you know what you're saying here is that is absolutely right okay okay Jim, um, that's all i have to say about it <laughs> Yeah, we've got another question. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how different groups remember the mainlander experience? I know this is the the, the main substance of your book, Meat and Potatoes. Um, so, you know, about the different groups, right? I, I'm not sure, you know, what this question refers to the different, is, you know, does this question refer to like different groups within the mainlanders? remember their own experience or or because what i mainly talk about is kind of you know there is and again there there's always this problem when you talk about collectivity in terms of memory right because i mean intuitively well when we when we come to think of memory it's like this is very personal this is my family history this is my memory um but i tend to see memory as you know because I don't like the term collected memory. I like the term social memory because memory production is a socialization process. You know, it's like, you know, the stuff you think it's, you know, it's important that you want to remember will come in, you know, what, what is actually part of your upbringing because, you know, that's your family history. That's what you absorb, the knowledge, right? And then you live through this time with this other people with the same society and you all come to conclusion in a certain way. And so I would say that, you know, my argument is that, you know, memory is the socialization process and there is this something called shared memory. And I don't like to call it collective memory because it's like, you know, it's like enforcing this ideology and everyone, you, you, you need to remember the same thing. No, there's, there's certainly a lot of diversity within this shared memory. Like when you talk about different groups, right? For example, there will be mainlanders that are really into um, Jensen, into like military families village. And I don't like the dependence village because I think that's, that sounds really formalistic, <laughs> you know, military in, in a sense, although that's the most common translation. I opt for military families village because you know, for second and third generation, you know, mainlanders will have basically lived. It's usually second generation. By the time you get to the third generation, most of the Jensons are already gone or in the process being torn down, right? This is special for this group of people, right? They And this is part of their family history. So, you know, on, on the larger sort of rubric, there is this, you know, 
larger rubric on the memory of 1949. Because without the 1949 displacement, without the Chinese Civil War, they won't, there won't be a, you know, a community of people, it won't be this community called Jensen. But there are memories that are specific to people who live in Jensen, and they talked about this memory and it's and and so there are also people that are into laoping uh and 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 then if you look at you know even stuff that's coming out of democratization like into the late 1990s and the 2000s there are like people that are the groups from from vietnam or groups being um, transported back from burma and of course, they all have different experiences, right? And they, you know, these are, there. But, but the interest, and and I'm not discounting all these diversity. I'm not discounting them. And of course, the most interesting group that I, the group that I'm studying right now, that I'm doing a project, right? It's actually the the people from Datra and Islands, right there, off the coast of Zhejiang Province, and they were evacuated, the entire community. Um, in you know in, in 1955, it's you know it's the, in in the wake of the first Taiwan Strait crisis, about close to 30,000 of them were just relocated to Taiwan, and and they built the nationals built all these villages for them all around the island, and they're not Jensen, they're not they're just different, right? But again, you can always sort of uh, you know you know refer all you know because all of these are you know exp ref experience of displacement right and there there is this certain point in time where all these diverse mainlanders started to basically read it you know for Dutch and people as well they might not they might not necessarily like you know agree with that we are mainlanders or part of mainland we're Dutch and people you know but we're Dutch and people in taiwan and we have a common history and that history uh actually doesn't start in china it start with that common experience of being this place you know to taiwan right okay i guess that's what i was my answer to my response to that question it's a good question again thank you dominic um i've got another question here could you share a little bit on how the doctors diagnosed the trauma of the wai shenmen you described in your book do you think it's possible that Benjamin might be more afraid to share their trauma with doctors in the context of the 228 incident? Is there a sense that mainlanders had more access to mental health therapy in the 50s and 60s? Yeah, I know this This question has, this, this is a great question, really. Um, I certainly won't discount the possibility that, you know, because, you know, there was, you know, I would say, maybe like structurally um you know the way in which um the medical sort of system or reimbursement the government actually support this type of you know uh, of therapy that there will be more and and it, and it's it's actually quite hard for a suppressed population to really came forward and try to basically um i i always think that's a possibility so um and I, and i think that's what i would admit that there is a limit to what historians can get out of right and of course the sources that i use you know to me they're primary sources because they're written by or they're really notes summary notes of um, this um, Taiwanese psychologist, he, Li, Dr. Lin Xian, and he's really the one who built, one of the people who built, you know, psychology and to study mental, mental illness because he was trained by the Japanese, right? And to head the, uh, the, the department, the, the psychology department at the National Taiwan University for the longest time. And those are, those are his conclusions. And based on his conclusion, I make this interpretation. And I, and I, and I did say, and this is from Dr. Lin Shen as well, because he was, he was sort of amazed at, you know, the, the high number of main, and, and part of that is due to, um, like, this is a community mainly made of a men, right? <laughs> Single men that were, that we know that, you know, the dislocation, within any dislocation right you know you're escaping 
a civil war and then you're forced to leave home for whatever reason that and you came to this very unfamiliar place although you have some political and cultural privileges different degrees of political over the local population and that's very obvious but you know it is really not that hard of for people to believe that you know they won't be suffering from and and you know definitely um dr lin chen's his diagnosis his notes his statistic over the year really show that but the question then the then the question you're asking right now it is it you know is there a possibility that you know the taiwanese population will be uh underrepresented in uh, Dr. Lin Xian's, you know, stats and diagnosis. And I would say that it is a possibility. It is, and I'll admit that. <laughs> I will admit that, yeah. Okay, um, uh, this is another good question. Um, I have a question concerning the role of your research for transitional justice in Taiwan. How does your research challenge the victimization narrative of Ben Zhenmin? And what does this mean for reconciliation? How to combine these two conflicting victimization narratives into one general history of Taiwan, which can be accepted by the whole population? Tough question <laughs> for you. Wow. <laughs> well, that's a super question. <laughs> um, you know, I, if it, it is, you know, you know, despite my, you know, my launch and on and joking out of you. That's actually a quite an important question. It is a question that, you know, if I, if I know the answer to that, like, you know, I, I could basically single handedly solve, you know, the, the memory politics and, you know, and memory conflict, uh, you know, problem in Taiwan. So, um, my, I'm actually writing, uh, you know, a paper on, on that. Um, it's going to be published in Chinese, but, you know, in that, paper because it's directed at a, a Taiwanese audience you know domestically right because I, I always thought you know this is this is to you <laughs> this this book is written for English language audience but um this the short answer is that e yes I mean victimization narrative it's you know it's sort of a part of the zeitgeist of our time because if you look at like pre-World War II, right? It was like, you know, the winner gets on, loser sucks, right? <laughs> People commemorate victories, you know, greatness, empire, progress, right? It's not gonna like, you know, if you lose, like, you know, you get massacred. Yeah, because you're weak in the social Darwinist game, like, you know, we'll be do too bad for you. But, you know, after World War II, it's like, yeah. So, you know humanitarianism you know and, and this idea you know help the you need to help the weak and especially in democratized society because we like to think of ourselves as promoting equality social justice and and all of that right and then so this idea of, of being a victim you know becomes becomes powerful like you know it's you know makes it there's just occupation of the moral high ground and so I always say that, you know, I put my hope in the the second and third generation because I think it's extremely difficult for people of the, uh, you know, like my my grandparents' generation, they, they suffer from the two, like my grandfather was put in jail. My grand uncle was executed by the nationalists during the 2-2-A, right? My maternal grandfather, he was in Green Island for a couple of years. Uh, just because he was a Japanese, uh, a former Japanese soldier fought in the Philippines and, and Tai Jong and they, they thought and took up arms against the government, which it didn't, right? Um, it was very hard for the people to experience it. So, like, I, I said this in the book, right? We should have, we, we're, we need to have, you know, sort of different standards for different, but, but for, I, I, I know for the post, generation right you know the post event generation it is so quite difficult and this is why we need to be very sort of vigilant about and in that in that paper that i'm writing i talked about the importance of this research that i call a history of memory there is historical memory memory of trauma right 
And there's something called the history of memory, which is to study the history of this tra trauma memory. Where does it come from? The genealogy, not only the, 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 the genealogy of it on the discourse level, but the kind of changing social and political structure that actually produce it, right? And I, I firmly believe that if we do have a better understanding of, of you know, how these memories sort of, of course, when you articulate them, right, it, it was sort of extremely powerful. Like, like I said, you know, some people will say, well, you're, you're trying to basically deconstruct these memories and showing they're fabricated or they're made. Yes, you know, and I, and, and, but, but I have to, but I have to stress that if you, if you really read my book, you you see that, you know, I'm not just saying that these are. I, I'm I'm actually not saying that these are false memory or fabricated. I said people make a conscious choice, and it's sometimes impulsive because this makes them feel better, and that's why it is so difficult, right? But if you can acknowledge that, you know, can acknowledge this therapeutic role of the memory, but at the same time be attentive to the to the, to the kind of you know negative affects you know the the then then we can at least you know in the end for the next generation you know come to something like we can you know we we can we can we can get into this process that i talked about the multi-directional emphatic and settlements right and it's very important to do this sort of cross-culturally you know, I very much sort of wish that a person of mainlander descent with that are really embedded in who loves Chiang Kai-shek <laughs> would basically write a book <laughs> about Taiwanese history or in or indigenous history and, and to go through the process that I went through because I would say that will change that person because it it changed it changed me personally. I I used to just hate the Bangladeshers, you know. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you for that very honest answer, Dominic. Um, I've got another question here that um, is also very interesting. Could you talk a, a little bit more about your the reception of your research in Taiwanese academia? Uh, how it was received by uh, quote unquote green historians. <laughs> okay, yeah, wow. I mean, the question I'm getting here is like, <laughs> there's, there, there's super questions. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, right now, because the book just came out, right? I mean, um, and it's not been translated into Chinese, so I don't know, like, as a whole, that how it will be received, but that remains to be seen. That really remains to be seen. Um, you know, you know, when I have time to basically work on the translation and have, you know, as, and has the entire book published in Chinese. But with that said, um, my experience of presenting um, some of my research to uh, you know people in the Institute of Taiwan History <laughs> or Academia, or not even that, um, but you know, like go to. Do you know what my my first? This is interesting because my first ever. Chinese presentation in Taiwan of a paper was made to um, this, uh, it, it was a gathering of the uh, the Taiwan Professors Association. And if you know the Taiwan Professors Association, there you know that they're one of the green camp think tanks, right? And the thing is this event that I went to to present, um, what later became chapter two of my paper, I remember, do you know what? Oh my God, you walk in and there are, I thought it was, I, I thought it's academic. So this conference happened in, in 20, 2011 or 2010 was, and there was actually a book <laughs> published afterwards. Um, I remember, you know, cause my, my, my talk was, it was at the second, you know, on the second day, right? the first day, um, there were already like verbal wrangling <laughs> between, <laughs> between, you know, some of the, Panelists were presenting on stage, and then this 100 or 150 people. I mean, some of them are academics, but most of them are not. They're general audience, and they 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 and there have been these buses like Yolanda that came up from the south. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and so you know, and this is a true story. I'm telling you for the sort of for for the first time. 
you know, because my panel was on the second day of the conference, right? So when I went home that night, I couldn't sleep because <laughs> I was very worried of what I'm going to say because there were only two panels that are presenting on the mainlanders, and I was one of them. I think the first panel already <laughs> stirred up some controversy. The second one, oh my, and and because I am I am talking about you know you know, the mainlanders being displaced and they're kind of like, um, you know, suffer through. Uh, and so I, so so long story short, what happened was that um, I mustered up my courage and, and gave my presentation and my, of course, I haven't done a Chinese presentation for the longest time, so it wasn't really good. And I was told that it was recorded. So you can, and I have to at the very beginning. I have to use my broken Taiwanese to, for for thirty seconds, anyway, to pay homage, right? Um, anyway, I, it turned out fine. But there were people in the audience that were kind of unhappy, but because I mean they're all being extremely polite. And then you know I'm going to end the story very soon because when I went to, um, you know, in the uh, you know, I went to the bathroom afterwards, right? And there are like, like you know, a line of men just, just sitting, just standing in front of the pit and peeing. <laughs> they're this, you know, person like standing right next to me and they say, oh, I was in there and I listened to your speech. And, and he said to me, like, you know, cause you return from Canada, pop, you, Probably you, you don't know too much about Taiwanese history. What you said there, yeah, it's yeah, I I can see that it's you know it's just it's 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 based on substantive research, right? But it's not real Taiwanese history. <laughs> you should study real Taiwanese history, right? And then there were afterwards there were all this old couple that came up to me. And they were extremely angry about the things that I said, and I think they just they they berated me for about five minutes and I, I'm just stood there. I just stood there and said, I'm sorry, but I, what I said, you know, offend your, um, and I, and I do, like I said, I do understand because I came from the same family background. I know the, the, the kind of emotional affect of the things that I said. Right. And that's why at the very beginning of my research, I, the, the reason why I ended up writing a book like this to be this sensitive to the kind of um, like emotion that, you know, historic, like historians are like, we're like a lot, a lot of us historians, like we, we do have that kind of power when you produce some kind of narrative and story and then it creates some effect in people, right? And at the very beginning, I, you know, of, the, of, my, of my research, I started thinking about that. These ex so, so these are, I would say negative experience, but I would argue that the outcome is actually good at produce this book. <laughs> deal with this kind of thing. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, all, all what I'm going to say, yeah. Yeah, wow, Dominic, I, I, you could write another book, a second book about your own personal trauma <laughs> and memory as a, as a historian of Taiwan, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I, as a historian, I study vegetables and not, <laughs> not, uh, and not what you study. Um, okay, uh, actually, I, I want to insert my own question. I think that um, this is kind of a good, segue to what I wanted to ask you, which is that uh, in the field of Taiwan studies, um, you know, approaching Taiwanese history from the lens of trauma and memory is, I think, uh, extremely fruitful. You know, it's something that um, is really relevant for looking mm -hmm. at a post-colonial society like Taiwan, especially one that has gone through multiple, arguably mm -hmm. colonial traumas. Um, but it's not it's not as widespread of a framework as I would have hoped. You know, I, I was first introduced to it from uh, Michael Zani's book, Cold War Island, where I think it's, it mm -hmm. works really well for understanding Xingmen, and it works really well for understanding Weissenden history. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about the making the case for using memory and trauma as a way to understand kind of Taiwan studies as a broader field? Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I think, you know, definitely, um, I agree with you that um, because of this, what, what you know, Taiwanese special is called the multi-layer colonial structure, right? And there's a lot of um, displacements, really, 
Um, I've, and of course, um, people like Joseph Allen talks about displacement, but you know, he sort of talks about in a way of, you know, the structure of the buildings and you know how you rewrite things. Um, and I always, you know, it's again, it's a beautifully written book. I'm, I'm nothing against, you know, um, you know, Professor Allen. Like I, I love that book, but you know, when I when I read that work like this, right, there's always like in the back of my mind, right, like you are scratching the surface <laughs> of, of all of the, all of this, uh, of you know, I think for lack of a better term, like structure of feeling. I don't, I don't want to like misuse the term, right, because Raymond Williams would use it. There's another specific sort of entire meaning to it, right? But you are, you are, you are absolutely right to point out that, you know. It could be such a fruitful area to go into, and given you know Taiwan's unique um, history, that being sort of colonized by, and and and, and people that actually live on this island, right, have to basically sort of you know change your identity and adjust to things, and and you have communities really living side by sides, and. And you know a, a, a new concept I'm working on is implication. Right? You know you are implicated to one another at certain point, and this implication sometimes could be very traumatic for different reasons. So when you think about trauma, right? It is you know of course it's you know again it really comes down to definition. Right? For me, it is this kind of you know sudden change that. You know, a person really need to basically adjust to, it. and it is extremely, extremely difficult to 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 adjust to, right? And people use, you know, any resources that they usually cultural resources that are hand to actually deal with it, and there could be a lot of uh, very like different situations depending on, you know, your your ethnicity, your social class, and and how you perceive your situation, and that's in like in different periods of, of Taiwanese history, like we really see, like like for for example, like you know, to to study the um, the early like Han Chinese expansion into Taiwan, right? The kind the kind of you know dislocation and cultural genocide. Of course, it is like you know for historian, it's really kind of hard to do that history. But I guess we can methodologically we can you know take from um, other you know, people in other like countries in other areas studying the indigenous population and how like folklores and legends and 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 and, and those kind of stuff. And again, the, the 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 common theme that basically just you know sort of connect these together will be this theme of trauma and then the re the reproductions of the stories in the communities, right? The oral history. Like I said, oral history, but like I said, that for me, they're all like memories passing down, right? And so, like I said, I, I find that to be extremely fruitful. And also all these different, you know, different like social groups, right? You know, um, you know, people at the margins of the society, not only the old soldiers, but also like the LGBTQ community, you know, at, at the present time and also like historically, right? And so, like I said, you know, and women, women as well right so there's definitely a lot really that can be done if you know that i think you know you know people and and it's a way to basically you know get taiwan studies out there right because you know you know trauma and memory and to a certain degree diaspora that's comp that, that's global concerns right people in other fields will be very interested in learning more about you know the examples that can take from taiwan is you know that could be very illuminating for their own the research in their own like like you know areas as well so yeah that's what i'm gonna that's all i'm gonna say yeah yeah absolutely um thank you dominic for indulging my question uh we've got we've got a few more questions to go through so um here's one can you talk a little bit more about uh mainlander experiences going back to China after the lifting of martial law. So in terms of the home and coming trauma that you discussed in chapter four. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in some is really, you know, as I, as I describe in a book, right, the, the chapter is called the, uh, the long row home because it is really long, right? There is this, it seems that the time 
basically stand still. And that's a way to basically understand this trauma. It's a, it's a social trauma of dislocation once again, right? But that dislocation is a little bit different from the previous dislocations, especially from the exodus, because the exodus, you're escaping war, you try to, and, or you're being kidnapped by the nationalists, or you're trying to find your family. I mean, it was, it was also trauma. But in terms of its nature, it's very different from this, right? This is, you have some kind of expectation, really. Um, and I have been asked in the past, right? And it, it about this question, like you talk about this expectation, but do you know what? Before most mainlanders went back, there were also already people returning from the United States, right? Hong Kong, right? And they, they wrote all these, these sort of, uh, the, the basically describing the same kind of disappointment in China. They have known already. And why would they? Yeah, to a certain degree. But like I said, if you're talking about your own home, your own family, the people that you used to know, the community that you are very familiar with. This is really personal. You have to see it yourself to be like, oh, I guess I can see what they're talking about now. Uh, and there's, there's really, there's really a lot of that. And that was extremely profound for we call it the 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 reverse cultural shock <laughs> nowadays it is a it is a shock to be and to be for a person just you know just returned to his home and and saw that everything looks so different because you know cultural revolution dig up all the graves you can't you, you the the a lot of them the one of the reason you know it's 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 not only to establish this relationship with the living right reestablish but with the dead as well because that's very important that's how that's why native place was such an important concept for for Chinese population living back then, because back then they saw themselves most, still most and foremost as, as, as Chinese. Uh, there, there might be Sichuanese or Shandongese, but, um, and this, it's location based, right? They have a connection with their ancestral graves with that community, right? And that's why you go back to, to your home to spend time with your family every Chinese New Year or your Qingming or whatever, right? And you couldn't really do that for the longest time. Now, you know, for the first time in 40 years, you have a chance to do that. Your retirement is like, okay, there's no grave. <laughs> and then, uh, and all your relatives. Yeah. I mean, like it was pretty emotional, but then there is this roller coaster and the more you, the more time you spend with them, the more you came to a realization that you are really now an alien in the place that you thought were home for the longest time. And like I said, that was emotionally, like I've, I've interviewed a lot of people. I've read hundreds of stories. People would just return, you know, sometimes they would just went back to their hotel in, in China and collapse because they couldn't, like mentally, that was too much to bear. And then when they came back, I mean, I mean, I know James came from a mainlander family. Oh my God. I mean, there must be so many of these stories, right? Then like I have people who told me that, you know, like have like second generation mainlander in Taiwan. You know, this person is a scholar and, and he said, my father, like ever since we know him, like as our father, he always talks about going back home, right? He's been talking about this for 40 years. And then he finally went home. Like he make all these preparations and, and exchange US dollars and jewelries and everything. And they brought everything back. And then he was there for, planned to be there for two weeks but he came back only like five days and then it was so sad and we're just it was kind of lost and then when you try to talk to him about it just refused to say anything and then he would just never return to china again it was just there's so many of course there are people's experience are different there are people who you know, have good relationship with their Chinese family, right? And I, I talked about these also, but overwhelming majority, and even like people who have really good relationship, I mean, they all say that, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is, you know, I will consider this place my home now. It's my birthplace, right? It's my birth, like, you know, I can, that can be, that fact can never take away from me, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to live here now, probably. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Um, so we have uh, 
have about three more questions to go through. We only have about five minutes left. So I'll just read uh, mm -hmm. a couple more questions and I'll let you choose, pick okay. and choose what you want to respond to. Um, one of these questions you, you kind of raised already, uh, which is how do the various mainland or native place associations, the Tong Xiang Hui, in mm -hmm. Taiwan affect the formation of this social memory? Um, another question is, do you see any changes in the interpretation of, uh, quote, mainlanders as colonizers, end quote, in the past five to 10 years, at it's become, as it's become normal for the DPP and KMT to take turns to win the presidential elections? Um, and then one more question. Um, if we use the framework of affective politics to think more broadly about different kinds of emotions and affects, flowing in the mainlanders' memories. Can you please address more on the role of institutional privilege, identity politics, political access to elites, cultural capital, and social status and advantages that the mainlanders have enjoyed? How have both the, um, the, the bright and the dark sides of, well, unfortunately, this, this question is cut off on my screen, um, mm -hmm. but I think that you kind of got the gist of that question. Yeah. Uh, so I'll leave these three for you. Yeah, I'll try to sort of, address all, all three of them in the time that I have left. Um, so very briefly, the Native Place Association, yeah, it, that's quite interesting because that, in, that, that entire part of history is now lost to contemporary mainlanders, right? <laughs> when, I, when I said to uh, uh, the professors in Taiwan, they're actually helping me with my research. Um, they're actually quite important for my research and they're all a, a lot of them second generation mainlanders. And when I talk to them, they always say, don't look into Tong Xiangwe, that's not important. Well, do you know what I'm thinking? My thinking is not important for you now because you're a second generation mainlander, but for your parents, those those were very important, right? And as I indicated in the book, um, Tong Xianghui in the 1950s, there wasn't really that much of these cultural activities, but in the, 1960s, there was really this social movement and a sense of community that's built around these. And it just speaks to, you know, the way in which that, you know, all these, you know, the, the existing sort of social network and cultural resources can be sort of appropriated by social actors to do and because and also because they're allowed to do it uh, this way we have to you know always keep in mind that there's a dictatorial you know nationalist dictatorship and there are some certain like structural restrictions right um the colonizers uh yeah the changing perception of you know i would say that you know you know especially in recent years there's definitely been a lot more acceptance of i mean you know the mainlanders they're you know, especially the you know, in terms of mainstream Taiwanese thinking, there there's just a, a acceptance that these people are part of Taiwan and their history is sort of part of Taiwan, right? In terms of party politics, I I would I would actually make an argument that you know it's it's going the other way because I I, I think you know you know not all KMTs are like but it's the way in which KMT is run today like I worry for them right you know increasingly a lot of their behaviors I've seen is like the you are really the fifth colonists uh, of China like I said I still refuse to believe that's completely true but the way in which they conduct themselves rhetorically like in the public sphere I right, really makes me worry about that. Uh, and the final point is the uh, the affect, right? Um, it's it's a it's a more complicated question. I mean, it's basically you know two elements, right? One is the affected politics; the other is like institu institutional privileges. Um, I sort of you know I I don't know if I you know get what the uh, uh, you know the person who really want. I I guess it's the uh, this sort of. Um, uh, how should I put it? This contradiction, I think, between, you know, a group of people that obviously, like structurally, that they are privileged in a certain way and they have all these uh, access to uh, these like institutional privilege and, and really help and and for some of them political power and and cultural resources right to dominate over everyone else whereas inside them themselves a lot of them really really suffer long term 
uh, from and do they basically try to sort of take it out on the local Taiwanese because and, and you know I I wouldn't sort of go so far as to say that I do you know want to point out that you know when the nationalists went very hard after you know you know the potential communists within the popular communist witch hunt in the in the 1950s right um there were I, I think of course there were a lot of tragedies and there there, there were arrest a lot of people who were actually not communists but the way in which the, the entire perch went down right like both mainlanders and taiwanese and a small number of indigenous populations suffer um and everyone suffer but the way in which i think the mainlander population themselves willingly put themselves out to help the state right and I think that's where I see this sort of, if we, if we want to put it that way, the affect of, of that trauma of the displacement and the things being deprived, not only material things, but their, their connection with their family, right? And that, that sort of emotion, that sort of hate. Uh, and they use the in, institutional privilege to, to basically not only suppress the local people, but also people that they thought were like enemies among themselves. And that's, that strategy, as I said, trauma begets more trauma. I said, you know, at the end of the book, if we don't deal with it, like we, if we don't, you know, have this proper process of working through whether it was from before or it, it is now. Yeah. This is why I wrote the book. <laughs> okay, th th that, that's it. That's all I have. I, I know that I go over time a little bit. Sorry about that, James. Not at all, Dominic. That was that was just fantastic answers, really nuanced, um, extremely thoughtful. And I think that was a, a great way to to kind of end end your your time with us today. Um, so once again, I, I just want to thank you, Dominic, for for spending time with us. For everybody, uh, buy the book. It's it's really excellent. I, I really have enjoyed reading it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again, Dominic. Uh, really appreciate your time with us today. All right, you know what. Thank you once again for inviting me. You know, I really, really enjoyed this talk. And I guess I'll see James. Uh, and thank James, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it as well. And uh, I get I get to see you and some of uh, the people that I, I can't see here at, at NASA conference next month. Right? That's right. <laughs> which That's I, right. I, I, I'm going to do this again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So we'll have, uh, I look forward to NASA. That's taking place virtually in May. Uh, mm -hmm. Give a shout out to NASA and looking forward to having that virtually. Um, we'll also have another book talk from uh, our UW Taiwan Studies program. We'll have Professor Dafit Fell, who will give a talk in his new book about green parties in Taiwan. Uh, mm -hmm. That's also coming up uh, just just a week, I believe a week after uh, mm -hmm. NASA. So um, yeah. look forward to seeing uh, the rest of you out in cyberspace. Uh, okay. Soon. All right. Yeah, okay. I, just, I just ordered that book. You know, I just, yeah, <laughs> the Green Party book, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, bye, everybody. Okay, bye. Okay.